It's good to know the reason that I've been at uni so long. It's not that there's something wrong with me, but there's something wrong with university. <laughs> the reality of this debate, of course, is one in which universities more likely have people submit not their best work, work that's considered incredibly poorly, and then universities having established a web of perverse incentives and worse, laziness, allow allowing things that should not go through to go through, then fail utterly and miserably to regulate those things. And the consequence to that is quite bad. The foundation of much of our public policy and public discourse is fraudulent, essentially. We would aim, in the same way that, for example, most companies send anonymous people to perform quality control by randomly checking when they don't know who it is, in the same way we would use these instruments as quality control measures to ensure that these uh, papers are in fact valid ones. There will be two arguments in this page. I'll begin by tracking the life of one of these papers and explaining how things that are so stupid are able to make it past muster with some of the smartest people in the world. And then I'll explain why that's such a bad thing. In terms of what we support in this debate, four things to say. The first is that the government will produce these papers. They'll do so in two discrete ways. The first is that they'll hire some bullshit artists who will just write these things out. The second thing that they'll do is use machine learning algorithms to identify the most popular forms of bullshit and then replicate them in a mad new style. Essentially in the same way that like the motion generator that you might get on the internet says like that the feminist movement should support like, I don't know, lounge back chairs. <laughs> we do the same thing with academics and just see if any of it goes through. Secondly, we would do it to all places that include peer review. Thirdly, we would often randomise names and use the names of people that are widely regarded in the field, and we would then, of course, compel them to silence about the fact that this has happened. <laughs> it's easy, easy to identify. We, we will seriously chuck academics in what's on our day. Finally, of course, in the first instance, we're going to publicise this widely and humiliate these uh, institutions. In the second instance, we'd be willing to use state funding models to, uh, to, 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 to modify their, their incentives, deny them grants and stuff like that, the quality of the work they're admitting in the shares. Thirdly, in certain instances, we'd be willing to revoke their licences. In terms of the mechanisms of this debate, all the characterization that I'm going to do is essentially either going to be about the incentives of academics, who obviously care about their prestige and their funding, or incentives of universities, who care about their funding and prestige. So by identifying, just notice that the incentive that I've identified there means that the characterization that I'm going to prove is, is self-correcting, which is why I don't have that line to third section to the argument, which is always called like mechanism. The characterization is essentially the mechanism. I'll take a point of information if anyone passes one. Well. Yeah. Do you think it would be correct for the government to create a robot learning program that produces random fake artworks for people to identify, and then to systemically disenfranchise people who fail to identify that they're fake artworks? Well, I mean, in the first instance, it's, it's like, the weird thing is, that people like track being like, reasonable, 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 reasonable. <laughs> then we've got fucking stupid debating buzzwords. It's about to get disenfranchised. <laughs> which is what academics are not, and musicians are. Which is the difference. So yes, but we would not humiliate the poor. We would humiliate academics. <laughs> Come on, mate. <laughs> I don't know. Did I miss something? <laughs> in five different places on the planet and then strumming at random beats and then they charge you what, $20,000 to learn how to do that? Of course they shut them down! <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, what is this? Right. Let me talk about why these things are produced. There are kind of a couple of incentives that are problematic to talk about here. The first is the universities put a lot of pressure on their academics to meet certain closures in the majority of circumstances of papers that they produce. Which means that academics are under a lot of pressure to write things a lot. And are also subject to additional pressures. Academics need to simultaneously teach. They also need to, they don't often make a lot of money, which means they often need to engage in other areas. Also, often their research is open ended and time consuming, but they have hard quotas that do not acknowledge the, uh, the, 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 the time sensitive nature of often their research. And those things mean that often they kind of need to bullshit in order to do this. Obviously, that is corrected because the university now is at risk whenever their academics like kind of punch it a bit. They're at risk if they allow a system that doesn't catch that to go through. They're going to get in a lot of trouble. So they'll want to fix that. They'll give their academics more time to write their things properly. 
Secondly, it's very easy for people actually to internalize the idea that academia is about jargon. Because the first thing you often learn is jargon. Like, the first couple of weeks of a lot of tutorials, like, particularly in like science subjects, is actually just like, this is what this word refers to, and stuff like that, right? And that often means that people learn more based around jargon than they do about concepts, which then means that they think the most important thing to do is be technically precise with the things they say, not be useful in the ways that they say. Thirdly, often it is kind of difficult to tell for sure whether or not something is total bullshit, particularly in philosophy. Mm -hmm. And fourthly, of course, often these academics are incredibly prestigious individuals who did great work in the past, but now essentially passed it, and they're able to get like anything through the keeper, because they know that people are very afraid of effectively critiquing them. No thank you. I assume it's just, I don't, I don't know. Um, <laughs> the next thing to say is, why are these things admitted? The reason they're admitted is simple. Sometimes it's because the people are under the pump to admit a lot of things, or they don't want to admit, they don't want to reject something from one of their friends, or they don't want to challenge somebody in their research and get involved in, 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 in needing to do more work because they made a particular critique the other person doesn't think is true. And particularly, when they're using a lot of jargon that often effectively validates these things and makes them be perceived as effective and worthwhile. So, let's turn to the second claim here. Why are these papers so bad? The first thing to say is that often they are the basis for real tangible world outcomes. That is to say, universities provide the information to find the way in the state's market. And critically, even if an entirely fraudulent paper, in, or like kind of a bullshit paper in and of itself, is not something that is used to govern that, given that they are often expected to draw from multiple studies, often if one or two of those is largely fraudulent or was conducted on false bases, that then creates the problem in which something is in policy is insufficiently proven when it is executed, and a false consensus has been manufactured out of the presence of bullshit. Secondly, you reinforce trends. That is to say, the job that these people are likely to use, the more it's self-reinforcing. The more you read it, the more it is affirmed, then the easier it is to get things through the keep up in these further instances, which then means there is even less information there. I want to finally talk about the screening of academics, because we think that when academics are able to get a lot of papers through, even when they're kind of stupid, that then means that the university misallocates its funding, resources, and opportunities to academics that are less thoughtful or useful. The harm to that, of course, is that the quality of work that they provide is really stupid. We give universities hard incentives to tighten up their, uh, their, their operations because they do not want to be humiliated in these ways. And in doing so, we correct against all of these problems. It seems like a very good idea. Um, I, I look forward to hearing Boston explain why in the context of music it is not. But this is not about music because the yeah. CAs are not crazy. <laughs>
prokaryote, you could be like, you just, that's fucking randomly generated. That's extraordinarily obvious for them to say, for them to see. It's very easy to peer review that kind of stuff out. And it's likely also not about the social sciences in general, because they, they rely on so much quantitative data that it would be very difficult to fake that kind of, that kind of study. And in the instance that there are the problems that Ben talks about, that pressure academics to, to do things like, you know, uh, publish shitty articles, there are many, many ways in which we could solve that problem that does not involve this stupid policy. For example, we could have tightened up restrictions on peer review, such as like, you know, more, they, you have to be reviewed by more different people, perhaps from a different institution to yourself. You, we would like lessen the pressures on academics to publish or perish and, you know, maybe give acad academics, you know, like, certain leeways and you know, give them fucking more holidays or something like that. There are all sorts of very sensible options that do not involve this. So, what is the harm that we are talking about in this debate? Because this debate is essentially about the things that it would be possible to, to that are written of skill. So it would be possible to mistake them for something. Yeah, that, is, that is the margin of this debate. I'll take a look. Uh, a monkey might be able to mash its face against the typewriter and write some philosophies. Yeah. still be able to publish it on the other side. The question is, if the journal claims that it's certified that that is philosophy, yeah. not something written by a monkey, should it be able to rely on anything like that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, because what we want to do is we want to create a space, and these spaces exist, where uh, experimental philosophy can occur, yeah? And the way journals do that is, you know, they fund people and they pay people in order to do that. And that is something extremely beneficial and would not happen in the real world. So, the first thing I want to claim is that because there are uh, one of the things that you know is useful in this debate to understand is the analytical continental divide. So this is basically divides between two different types of thinking about philosophy and about literary theory. Analytical, and this and this divide is actually termed by the people who call themselves analytical, which are essentially the Anglophone speaking countries, so like Australia and other Yeah. So those are the ones who are rigorous and who are clear, they're precise with their language, it's very it would be very obvious if they were faking it, they would likely be unaffected. Continental philosophy is stuff that is far more akin to literature. It is something that is often very difficult to understand without delving into it very deeply. It is something that often references very obscure sources and so on. And all those, those types of thinking are the ones that are going to be affected. So, why is that type of thinking extraordinarily valuable and why it does astound you? Because lots of obscurity is necessary and beneficial in these disciplines. Number one, because plain language does not provide us with the means to understand many things because language constricts the way that we think currently and you need to be able to use forms of language that are uncomfortable and difficult to comprehend in order to be able to criticize certain aspects of the way that we construct the world. For example, some of the most, some of the best and most influential animal rights philosophy is stuff like, you know, Derrida's The Animal That Therefore I Am, which is an extraordinarily strange and complicated book, but it has to be because the way in which the way our language and culture is constructed to devalue animals and make us equate people who are morally lesser to us to animals is, is, is extraordinarily complicated. And language, plain language, just doesn't make, let us make that argument really with any force. And the same is true of how Southern American books such as, for example, Biopower, which is one of the most, which is one of the most significant texts and was actually very politically organizing for Southern American countries in a critique of neocolonialism, those kinds of things are also difficult for them to critique because their language and their way of thinking has been constructed by the colonial powers. They have been planted this language that opening government would like everyone to use upon them that prevents them from thinking other things. But secondly, a lot of this type of glossy and thinking is not really making arguments, and that's where that's it is that's where you can't really judge it on like, well, is this an argument that makes sense, which is presumably the way that you could judge these things in peer review. It is more like an exercise in revelation because the, the, I think the best way to think of the analytical continental divide is the analytical di uh, is is you take what people currently believe the world, their intuitions about you know colonialism or morality or whatever, and then you think, all right, we have these intuitions. Now, how do we build a moral structure on top of that? Continental thinking says, let's question those intuitions themselves. Let's think, why do we feel these things about morality or whatever? Yeah. The problem is. How do you do that? What are these academic tools that you use? It's, there is no set way to do that because it is about questioning the fundamental kind of feelings that we have about the world. And that is why you have to, again, create very strange types of discourses that are akin to art in order to make people actually question themselves. What do they say? 
They say, well, the benefits might the, the benefits won't trickle down, or maybe it'll be half well, Obviously, a bullshit article likely won't affect anything at all because it's like incomprehensible. People will be like, well, this isn't going to inform my policy. But the benefits do trickle down because radical thoughts will be dismissed too soon by this opening government team. For example, through codes like, you know, books would have been dismissed like 30 years ago. They'd be like, what the fuck? This person's claiming that a school is like a prison? What a loony. And nowadays we all use it in debates because we're like, yeah, the government does control our thinking in ways that are very harmful. And secondly, it will inspire other clearer thinkers. So for example, Nietzsche, extraordinarily unclear, possibly a phony. Richard Rorty, inspired by him, creates a very valid structure of philosophy that actually helpfully informs the way we make our political decisions. It would be immoral to chill the speech of those organizations and to not subsidize them because that's where we experiment about the future of the human race. That's why we're proud to oppose. Well, thanks, Austin, for the participation. And to continue the case for opening government, he's been saying Tottenham since most of us started debating. We don't know why he's now in a final. The annual number! Derrida is not at stake in this debate, and it is actually offensive to lump the wisdom of Derrida <laughs> in with the white noise music that appeared in the POI's romantic intuition and lump the crucial parts of that case. Because we can detect hacking of the good faith measures that characterize even the philosophy that Boston was discussing. Because human perception, or like our perception, lay people's perception, of whether something is occurring in good faith is not the test here. The test is a combination of experts detecting uncanny patterns between that work and bullshit, or computers generating the thing in explicit bad faith and catching the errors that way. So how do we know that we can detect fakes even when they closely or superficially to external observers might resemble something created in good faith? First, for example, humans can come up with large strings of random numbers which can be detected by computers to follow a particular pattern in ways that are different from, say, machine-generated encryption. There is a difference because our brains are not able to generate randomness on the same level that a real computer can. And that is a reason why even if something looks fake or bullshit to, two different, to, to an expert and to a layperson, an expert can make a value judgment about exactly if it really is. That is the nature of expertise that comes when just because people, certain people can't perceive the pattern, the pattern might still be underlying. The second point to make here is literature, which is the analogy here, is not always uh, deserving of peer review status. Like you would think that this stuff would not exist anymore or would not be read by anybody. If it does not meet the threshold, then worst case, it ends up published elsewhere. It still exists on our side. We heard it would cringe experimentation. Experimentation does not entail uncanny, but unrecognized, like undisclosed parallels to previous texts. Then we heard that obs obscurity can be good. The idea that your claim is unclear and open-ended and deliberately so is already a recognized element within these philosophical fields. So, if you're the next Derrida publishing something in that tradition, well then that's all you are claiming to do. There is no bad faith, you wouldn't be caught because you wouldn't apply an algorithm that would detect bullshit in that fashion. Yeah. But, if you are deliberately being obscure, then that is detectable for the reasons I gave. Like, if your uh, new Derrida happens to publish something that maps uncannily onto Mein Kampf, that is a test that might be invisible to someone who reads it as a lay person, but would not be to one of the people who is running this or to the computer that generated the thing that caught it. That is the difference. 
So we are not dealing with art in this debate. And that's important because the stakes are much higher when you're not only dealing with art. Firstly, we are discussing a number of areas that have a bearing on direct public investment, for example, infrastructure and social priorities. But to the extent it is merely cultural, like merely cultural development or human knowledge, then these uh, bad faith actors are actually akin to people who are peeing in the pool of the, the human knowledge. That is, <laughs> if it was clear, even like just with good faith things that not everyone can understand, people who choose to pursue this would be able to peer into it and divine a meaning from clearly having the opportunity to do that. But if there are bad faith actors who are polluting that field, then you no longer achieve the benefits. Like the actual future derivatives suffer because of the bullshit that remains undetected on their side and which they did not contest. Please. We don't need to get good at identifying bad faith articles in a world where they aren't submitted in bad faith by the yeah. government. Either this machine has to identify problems in data, which we can do by more stringent peer review, or has to decide what has academic merit and what is bullshit or not. Where on that spectrum do you stand, and why is it justified? So like, we never think a pretty clear test for when the threshold would or would not be met. Uh, which is partly machine learning and partly having experts do it. But the problem is that there's no incentive at the moment for anyone to really like streamline here because you often profit by like, A, allowing something to be published or B, getting something published even in a lower quality journal. And that's why we think there's a systemic risk that this this field faces. Firstly, because knowledge tends toward, in all fields, knowledge tends towards the technical and incomprehensible in the same way that modern day microbiology would be incomprehensible to a witch doctor in like the 1400s. Like the, the way that knowledge develops becomes impenetrable to people as a feature of it, not a bug. Second of all, the people often learn, especially the PhD students who are like post PhD people who are we're discussing here, we want to weed out more of. That group often learn the vocabulary of a field first and then fudge the logic and learn the full truth later on. Third, uh, third, there are many interpretations of reality here. We, we just want to weed, like, weed out those that have an uncanny resemblance to previously published texts or established patterns of bullshit. And if the effect is many people who thought Derrida had something to say discover he did not, well then they can continue to consume him in an art gallery and not a peer-reviewed journal that claims that he's saying something about the world which we cannot be sure that it is. Why will this be effective? First, it is a clear signal of academic malpractice akin to plagiarism. And that means that in many cases it won't be about going after people to punish them, it will in fact be the simple operation of a new incentive on faculties and journals to institute basic integrity measures. It is appropriate to put the onus on those institutions which does not exist at the moment because they make substantial claims on our public funding and on the, imp by the impact they have on our lives because based on their supposed access to a capital T truth but they are at the forefront of human knowledge and innovation and expression. And if that claim is found to be bogus, they are ripping us all off directly. That is why the onus is appropriate to place on them. But second of all, it's obviously in their capacity to address, because they have the experts. That is in fact what they claim to have. They should in fact do, like, direct that expertise to the integrity of their output and not merely maximise the output, which is the incentive in a commercial marketplace where you need to have your things either consumed or where you simply want to have influence via more citations, in which case, again, the incentive is on quantity and not quality. We need to correct for that, and we're so far we're the only team discussing it. Thirdly, we just expect more people will be appointed on merit and a better qualified conception of merit based on your ability to output things that other people understand, which is relevant even in obscurantism, if that is the only location of the debate were to take place in which it is not. Because <laughs> even in obscurantism, there's a distinction between the claim that I'm not intending to be fully understood and the good faith and deliberate like, obfuscation of your argument. That is why we're not risking Derrida, and if we were, he could be read elsewhere, and that's why we're proud to propose. <laughs> Our next speaker has won Easter's and Easter's. They have seen courses more responsible than yours. <laughs> 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 Gracias.
about academia and then I'll talk about academics. So firstly on academia, our claim is that this policy unacceptably changes the way in which reviewers admit articles or fail to admit articles to journals because it creates an overwhelming desire amongst the academics responsible for reviewing those articles for clarity and simplicity. When you literally fire people who are responsible for these, reviewing, for these reviews if they make one slip up, when you jeopardize the entire reputations of these articles and threaten to shut them down and to cut off the scant funding that they have, that they get from the government, you know, the couple of thousands of dollars that they get a year, merely for admitting something that they maybe or may should, maybe or maybe shouldn't have admitted in the first instance. Opening government's response here is to say, well, in most instances, you would be able to tell. The first thing to note here is that our claims are not contingent on whether or not it is possible for academics to determine whether or not an article has been randomly generated or is just made up of gibberish randomly written by some dude in the government. It is reliant on the notion that if people know that the government will randomly submit articles to journals, then that will create an overwhelming chilling effect regardless of whether or not these articles are readily identifiable because the mere possibility of a slip up is, and, the, and the large consequences of making that slip up are sufficient to make academics way more than overly conscious as to whether or not the decisions that they are making are good or not. But the second thing to note is that I would dispute that it is true that you are unable to tell, you are able to tell in other circumstances. Many of you may be familiar with the writer Samuel Beckett. One of his seminal works is called Know How On, and the first like 10 pages of the work are the words no, how, and on <laughs> repeated over and over again. And maybe if you're not a literary theorist or you don't do an art, you didn't do an art degree in English like you did, you might seem to think that that is nonsense. But the thing to note is that that is an extraordinarily useful, if niche, deconstruction of language that does contribute meaningfully to the field of literary theory. The other thing I would note there is that the journal that published the so called article literally published works written by Derrida in the past and it's very likely that those very same journal articles would make the decision to omit all continental philosophy in the future if it meant that the academics could save their own jobs, yeah? Because if they make one mistake, their reputation is tarnished forever, their life's work is tarnished forever, and they have no alternatives. The final thing I will say on opening government's uh, analysis here is that by their own analysis, this process of identification is difficult. Many articles require the use of gibberish or they require the use of terms that have been newly created in order to describe things that humans have not had to think about before. And if their problem is that, well, these computers could randomly generate those words, well, so too do humans in the normal processes by which individuals conduct continental philosophy. So that is the reason to believe, those are the reasons to believe that most, in most circumstances, it would be very difficult for academics to tell. Uh, James. I just want you to assume for a moment that we will throw out the uh, baby of Derrida with the bathwater, but also that the bathwater will include, for example, anti-climate science journal articles which substantially hold back public debate, and then I want you to compare the harms that you've presented with the huge benefits that we're making. Okay, so... Uh, you know, I dropped this because I thought it was, you know, silly enough to not really matter in the debate. So, kind of, open government has alluded to this as well when they talk about policy, you know, journal articles that change government policy and so on and so forth. First thing to note, as Boston has already told you, most scientific journals are extremely easy to verify. They're based on things like data science and, uh, you know, verifiable data. You can be like, did you conduct this study or not? And you go ask the people who were supposedly in the study, and they're like, no, this person never asked me. <laughs> <laughs> the second thing to is they have very little influence on government policy. Yes, the harm is extremely marginal. A government that's deciding whether or not it should implement climate policy is not like, well, I guess we'll just trust the article willy-nilly and, you know, we'll see what happens. They also conduct their own reviews and see whether or not it matches up with the science produced in journals. Presumably their uh, uh, arguments are something along the lines of um, whether or not kind of... Uh, you know, like the, the public is willing to trust something that's peer reviewed but might be a bit junk science. Uh, that is an argument to strengthen the strength of peer review, as I would know unless the opening government's argument. The additional thing I would say is that in that circumstance, it doesn't really matter whether or not the article is peer reviewed. If you're the type of conspiracy theorist who thinks that climate change is not real, you're likely to believe it whether or not it is published in a scientific journal, so that harm is extraordinarily marginal. What are the harms that we tell you? Firstly, I'm presuming that their argument is about throwing out things like Jacques Der like Derrida. This is extraordinarily biased towards certain schools of thought. It's biased towards analytical philosophy, which creates clear and distinct conclusions, and it is biased towards conservative thought that remains within the confines of predetermined academic knowledge, because those are the reference points by which governments are likely 
to judge whether or not a peer review process is good or not. The second thing we would say is that obscurity is necessary in a lot of circumstances to advance human knowledge. A lot of knowledge, as Boston, a lot of language, as Boston tells you, is inadequate to the thought to describe the thoughts that we have to have because language is constructed by feudal lords in the past. It's constructed by colonialists in a way that shuts individuals out from being able to speak meaningfully about their experiences. It's the reason that things like the the, the binary dynamic of things like race and gender are being gradually deconstructed by academics who create new terms that this government bench would turn gibberish in order to describe concepts that have been shut out from public discourse in the past. And that is, at least I think, you know, it is equally moral, uh, morally equivalent to say we ought to afford academics the space to discuss things like gender equality in a meaningful way, just like we ought to afford them space to discuss, discuss things like climate science. The second thing, but the third thing to note is this shuts down experimental philosophy. Uh, open government's response to this is, well, you can just continue publishing. But the problem is this, most peer-reviewed articles, which create the, have the most capture in the academic world, require you to reference other peer-reviewed articles, which means that opening government in their best scenario where the philosopher is able to continue publishing themselves confines that philosopher and their philosophy to obscurity because they will never be referenced in actual publications that appear in peer-reviewed journals. But also, it's very unlikely they'll be able to do so. You know, like, it's very expensive to publish, there's not a lot of funding and so on and so forth. Finally, they're like, well, what if some rubbish gets through in the lens of political philosophy? Well, who cares? Because opening government's presumption is like, they, they, they kind of presume that there is some truth out there which people can't access unless they approach it in the right state of mind or in good faith, which is untrue. And that is the precise point of things like aleatoric music. There's a point of things like, you know, musicians like John Cage who write, you know, blank, uh, you know, pieces of sheet music. The point isn't that you need to necessarily, or what's the point of things like Dadaism, right? Which, which is literally bad faith in art. Mm -hmm. The point of that is that there are truths that can maybe be machine generated and people can still learn from and this fundamentally destroys that knowledge. Finally, on academics, this is very difficult to detect. Presumably, governments, especially right-wing governments, have an enormous incentive to discredit academic academia in general because it's seen as bourgeois or whatever, or, or, you know, like stupid or whatever. And this gives the government the precise tool it needs to control that knowledge in a way that's hugely detrimental to academia in general. That's what we have. And welcoming from government is made splashes in the debating community such as the Austral's open mic night. If you close your eyes and kind of sounds like Chris Bissett, it's Jack Reed! <laughs> to come and automatically check all these articles and for some reason reject some and accept others. What actually happens is that we create a bunch of bullshit articles, submit them to journals, and then those ones which actually accept and publish those get criticised, fined, shamed, and essentially shut down. That was the model that we had from our opening. What this means is this is a specific checking process of the peer review process to ensure that they actually do this and actually ensure that the articles that they are publishing are legitimate. Because if they're not, then things like this will slip through the keeper. But if they have a legitimate checking process, if their peer reviewing is good, and if they actually have some way of ensuring that every article that they publish is a legitimate article, then they won't ever get caught foul of this, and they'll be absolutely fine. If anything, and what I'm going to prove in my speech, is that they actually get more trusted, more believable, and we get better results for, this, for society as a whole. It's important to know that journals get to pick the peers that review it. So it's not, important, it's not only important to just strengthen it. We need to actually test how it works. 
what goes through it, and what happens. Quickly on a little bit of setup before I get to my speech. I, I think there's been a crisis of characterization about what kind of things are, are, are actually part of this. I think that science definitely falls a part of this because this is something that while there are specific things that we can test, we need to, one, ensure that they're actually testing it, but two, as I will later get on to, there is a huge problem with corruption and pay for, pay for published journals, and we actually test which journals are doing this and we're able to publish and shame them. Three points in this speech. Firstly, why the biggest crisis in academic credibility is corruption. Secondly, why this model specifically improves the credibility of all journals, especially niche fields. And thirdly, why it's specifically important for the state to run this checking process. So, on my first point, the biggest crisis of credibility is specifically that of corruption. Why is that the case? The big, in society generally, we have kind of a weird mistrust building of academic journals. And that's because there is a bunch of bullshit stuff that's being published by journals. A lot of this comes from things like, you know, pay for, pay for published journals, where you essentially pay them a sum of money so that you can get your bullshit articles published. What, and we think that this is a huge problem. Secondly, we also think that things like cash-strapped universities are increasingly reliant on things like corporate funding to be able to get these things coming through, and that manifests itself in stuff coming through this process. When they see an article on Wonder Drugs, they don't necessarily check the methodology that thoroughly because it comes with a huge sum of money that comes through it. In our world, when there are bullshit articles like this that could potentially come with sums of money, then they will thoroughly check it and they will ensure that these are actually legitimate things. Secondly, many journal journals are explicitly ideological. And we think that there are anti-science journals who publish, publish very poorly researched anti-vax journals. And they have huge effects on society. There is a reason that the number of people who are anti-vaxxers is increasing. It's because there is an, in, an increase in the amount of people who are doing it. Was that clarification or information? Cool. Um, easy. Um, e even if the number of journals articles is small, it has a huge social impact. Because firstly, most members of the public don't check credibility, so they either one, just believe everything, or two, believe nothing. I think both of these are extremely damaging because either they believe bullshit or there is a significant mistrust in all academia, which I think is very bad, especially for government policy. On our side, peer review is a very clear signal that we check regularly and we ensure that everything that is published with that stamp on it is legitimate and is good because they keep rejecting bullshit stuff. I'll get on to later why, why the state makes this even better. But secondly, even if the article is late de debunked, it, 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 that debunking has a big, part, a big effect on the public, and especially if it is scientifically proven at the time, and there's nothing to suggest that it is necessarily wrong at the time, then if that's the case, and it is currently you know, the best science of the day, then it probably should be something that we accept and believe. Okay, secondly, why this improves the credibility of four journals, especially in niche fields. So I've noted already that there's a bit of a crisis of confidence in academia going from, from things like, um, you know, uh, um, corruption. All right. Um, uh, so, so I think uh, I think that what we're actually able to do through this is we're able to ensure that this process is much better, so that people actually are able to, as a whole, agree, uh, believe, and agree with much more academic journals. And this means that, notably for politicians, they are able to much more regularly base their policy off this because they are able to go, this is actually something which is legitimate, this is something which is believable, and then they can actually present that to the public as something that the public will believe in, and that becomes a much more positive convincing policy and something which is actually backed up by science and research. Notably, things like economic articles would hugely play into this and is something that will uh, is certainly be caught up with, uh, with this model. It also means that specifically niche or controversial fields, people that might pu publish something which is scientifically correct or is correct based on all of the knowledge we have of the day, but this is the stuff which falls the most foul of the crisis in confidence. Because it's the stuff which it's easiest not to believe. If, there are, if it's some crazy controversial niche opinion, then it's something which is much, much easier for people to reject, much, much easier for people to not believe, and it's also important for Given that your mechanism is that people are willing to publish bullshit articles when it comes with a payout for them, but your mechanism is publishing, is submitting bullshit articles without a payout, why would it catch those types of I think that we certainly could just submit some of them with payment to, to ensure that. But I also think that it is likely to catch up with them anyway because they don't have a rigorous checking process. And, uh, uh, and yeah, whatever, James will deal with it even more. 
Um, okay, so the, the finally, why it's specifically important for the state to run this checking process? I think that it is all, that the alt-right already runs some form of this, you know, submitting bullshit articles to them, and it's been specifically bad because of the stuff that they've targeted and been able to discredit, things like climate science. But note here that the state is specifically better because, one, it can publish its successes as well as its failures. So that means that when they fail to actually get a journal to publish this stuff multiple times, then they'll say, yes, this is a specifically trustworthy journal, we've tested them, we're very sure in it, and it will also publish those ones that are failing, that's very good for those journals. But secondly, it's unbiased and we'll just check everyone. So don't have to leave this to the alt-right that's just going to check progressive policies on climate things on climate change. It's going to check everything coming from everywhere, and it's going to catch up all of those weird alt-right uh, journals which are publishing a bunch of bullshit science which for some reason is being believed by the public. At the end of the day, what we did is we ensured that peer reviewing got better by actually testing it. We ensured that it was a more rigorous process and we ensured that all journal articles were more believable to the public, meaning we had a huge public benefit. I think that it's very clear that we win this debate. And now welcome in. Oh, I actually don't know Thomas that well, but <laughs> this is a lady whose ability to weave Taylor Swift lyrics and debates where they run, but is only rivaled by that of his teammates. Oh, that's <laughs> <Robin>. <laughs> Around, you know, 
odd ideas about trans misogyny in animal communities, which many of these papers are about, that is probably an important issue. And maybe the exact paper that is publishing it attacks it in a very odd way. But as a general issue that comes from it, those are important things. Secondly, to point out those progress over time. So if something is crazy to say now, it is unlikely to be so crazy in the future. Things like animals having consciousness would have been a crazy paper that you would have been punished or shot down for publishing 40 years ago. But are not now, and this is a chilling effect that does not exist in a singular moment, is one that goes forward. But likely also falls upon things like government beliefs that you and you know Jimmy are more likely to publish papers that are you know pro-communist or think that communism could be good for some animals, which perhaps it very well could. But importantly, it is not a standard the government should be deciding at what point that something is, you know, academically rigorous or not. That is something you should leave in the fields of academia. The government itself is often punished or made hard to publish certain ideas. Second point of extension, which is really just saying this is a totally unnecessary policy. Because, no, thank you. Academics are already receiving post-publication forms of criticism, and this is not just a reliance on peer review. That comes from other journals, and a main, you know, main way to get up is to show that another journal published something that is crazy, and your article can be disproving that. Because either it is incredibly easy to determine whether or not these articles are ludicrous, in which case they've already picked up either by peer reviewing or by post-publication reviewing, or it's incredibly hard for those other methods in order to determine it, at which point it is unfair for government board to shut down or fire people who have published that article, when all these other academics and all these other boards also could not determine those things. Because importantly, and I'll take you in a moment, there are important discursive many, you know, elements that come from those things which are often there are elements of proof of an article articles that are a bit crazy, ideas that come from it, as I told you before, things like animal consciousness. But secondly, even if this gets on something, it is really useful to be able to dispel through other forms of journals uh, as a form of discussion that can only come from academia. Finally, and like, thirdly, why this is a necessary section of the article. Yeah, well, your counterpart appears to be using government resources to vet the peer review process. Wouldn't that run into most of your problems about radical work and run into most of your openings problems about stuff that is essentially indistinguishable from bullshit? No, that was just one possible way in which you could improve the peer review process. We also said you could change the ways in which cross-checking happened, you could finance other reviewers in order to try and get those papers, you could change the standards that certain papers are held to. We do have many ways of one possible one. So, what the why books attack are necessary parts of academia. All those such stuff is like, you know, important continental philosophy philosophical ideas to shut up, here's an expansion of that. Firstly, this is an unfair attack on left-wing journals, which are much more easily parodied in the kinds of language that they use, that the concepts they rely on, especially as they become more radical, are not within general social societal canons, because they often rely on those more complex ideas. And it is a right for those journals to have left-wing or radical concepts, but now by this policy are punished. Secondly, it shuts out new methods that, do, that you know go away from traditionalist ones. That we're finally in many political science moving away from positive quantitative methods towards things like ethnographies or towards more qualitative, you know, deep studies of places, which are now punished by this because they are far less able to be certain that those things are true because their evidence is in many ways sort of jargony, you know, airy stuff that happens. But it is the only way for those kinds of things to be published, and it's also worth small journals who often do not have the resources to provide incredibly, you know, comprehensive checks on these things or do incredibly comprehensive evidence, you know, backing up for their things. Fourth piece of extension, why this attracts more important problems in academia, this is a refocusing on how we should determine papers as a witch hunt, witch hunt for fake articles, which attracts more important issues like, you know, subtle methodolog methodological problems, you know, ways in which different terms and papers are coded, because all you've said is what we need to fight is a simple problem around fake ideas or fake news or fake absurdities within that, or it's things like a bias in the academic area, those are more important things that we should focus on either as a government or encouraging more change between, rather than a creation of these articles. This is totally unnecessary and <laughs>
We have explained that there is a set of articles where there is an objective truth that corporate funded and ideological journals are not finding. The first question I'm going to ask in my speech is how do we weed out bullshit in academia? And secondly, I'll ask how do we restore trust in academia? It's the first question. The opening half have talked almost exclusively about fluffy humanities. We're talking about a set of articles that are more policy relevant, like environmental science or economics. Why is that more important? Firstly, because the costs of bullshit are so much higher. Unlike the costs of pseudo derrida, which are very unclear, these have important impacts on the policy debate. We ask open opposition to make that way up in appointed information, and they refuse to do so. Secondly, because the exposure to the public is much higher. A study on the effects of welfare on unemployment gets way more coverage in the popular media than a study about continental philosophy. Now, why is that crucial? It's because for an academic reader, the distinction between this is in a peer-reviewed journal and a non-peer-reviewed journal is a distinction that matters, but it's not a life or death distinction. And that's why articles that are really pressing the boundaries, uh, assuming that they didn't get into peer-reviewed journals under our system, they would still be able to press the boundaries within the academic discourse to some extent, because academics do read stuff in trash journals sometimes and are able to evaluate it on its own merits. By contrast, though, for public consumption, the public is able to understand this journal is peer-reviewed, this journal is not as a signal for article quality, because most people in the general public don't know the names of journals, but they understand things like the peer review process is very important. And that's why it's incredibly valued that we preserve that signal for the members of the public. If this is in a journal, uh, if this is in a journal of this type, it should be trusted. The last reason why this area is more important is because the harms of this policy fade away which open opposition appear to admit when they can see there are objectively valuable methods in, for example, uh, hard sciences or economics, like statistical methods, and they use this to say, well, that means that any science article must be good because it's easy to check those things, therefore any published article would check those things. Firstly, we know that this is empirically wrong because there is a lot of junk science. <laughs> it's often the same organisations and the same people who, for instance, use, uh, use junk journals to publish tobacco industry funded science disputing the relationship between tobacco and cancer, who are today using junk anti-climate science journals to refute the link between, uh, uh, between carbon emissions and climate change. Secondly, they have a strong tendency not to check because that's often what they get from their corporate funding, which is what we explained to you, remember, and wasn't responded to. The main line of response from the opposition bench is to say, we would prefer to reform this process in other ways, like, for example, strengthening the peer review process. So let me talk about this in detail. The first thing I want to say is this will be very hard for the state to do, so much so that it will be realistically impossible. There are a lot of journal articles published every year. It is unrealistic to believe that the state will be able to engage in a thorough data checking exercise of each of them. The state has a limited degree of resources to devote to this because most people don't understand the importance of academic work. So let's do it the cost effective way. The analogy would be, uh, using open government's analogy, which I think is good for everyone, rather than check every good in the marketplace, why not put some goods in the marketplace that you know are the bad ones and then closely track them? This, uh, and, and we also explain why just strengthening the peer review process, as open opposition say, clearly can't be enough because a journal gets to choose which reviewers it wants to send an article to. So, for example, the US Study Center at my university, which is funded by Raytheon, it will choose a set of reviewers who it knows are more sympathetic to pro United States foreign policy articles. And the state can't really control for that because the state doesn't have like, the full glossary of, you know, are these people objective and independent? It doesn't know everyone in academia. So that's why it would be very hard to do it. The way to do it. Secondly, assuming that what you have suggested is possible, it would still be a lot worse. It would still be a lot worse. So, for example, they are asking, um, they are asking the government to look at something published by the US Study Centre and to say, is this an, a, a kind of objective and academically valid defence of United States foreign policy, or is it a bullshit defence of United States foreign policy? And that's an incredibly subjective question that's hard for the government to figure out, because often there will be kind of shades of grey in these kinds of questions. And that's why it's a lot better on the outside when you inject something that everyone knows is going to be rubbish, and that can be our litmus test because it could not be disputed that it's rubbish. So if the opposition, as they purport to be, is worried about state control of academia, they must not support the state checking every article published by an academic, and must instead support the state putting into the, into the system things that we know to be rubbish and then well, testing out whether or not people admit that they're rubbish. We have won the most important point in this debate. Secondly, how do we restore trust in academia? If there is a government or public which disregards science so much that they will believe the 0.1% anti-vax or anti-climate change studies, 
why would this policy suddenly reveal the lead them to any like significant margin? It doesn't need to. It doesn't need to. So most governments around the world aren't anti-vaccination. Most governments around the world aren't our anti-climate saying, aren't anti-climate science. But the existence of some of those articles sows the seeds of doubt in the public's mind that makes it easier for people to say, I don't know whether or not this should be at the top of our list of issues, or I don't know whether or not we should vaccinate our children. It doesn't seem that good for me, and I hear a lot about the risk of it. So we're not saying uh, it's, it's about where you know, 100% of people have the wrong idea, we're saying 1% is more than sufficient. Even if it's debunked later, a lot of people don't hear about the debunk. Trust in academia. I want to fixate on the grey area of pseudo-bullshit, which is kind of rubbish but makes some contribution. Firstly, the test can account for that. We would be happy for the so-called department to employ some continental philosophers if open opposition, since they support peer review, they must concede those people are capable of testing whether or not you know, what the machine generates is a legitimate academic article. The second response is that quasi-rubbish can still be published, it just won't be in peer-reviewed journals. And that's appropriate, because that means that people can engage with it if they're seasoned academics, but they have the warning sticker of this hasn't gone through the usual test. Closing opposition says, you're sowing doubt. No, the doubt exists under the status quo because there's already a crisis of confidence in academia. You would have more trust if you believe that every article has gone through this process. They analogise this to entrapment, a common, highly effective and often <laughs> used legal process to find crime. Then they say this is going to be very harmful to the left. It's only going to harm the bullshit elements of the left. And yeah, it's going to help most of the non-bullshit elements of the left. Because you know the way that most people engage with critical race theory? They engage with it on the grounds of that one crazy article they read that one time in college, which was published in the top journal on critical race theory. But most articles on critical race theory are not like that. There's those discrimination about the racial wage gap and about experiments where we find out about unconscious bias. And if 100% of the articles you read about critical race theory spoke about it from that perspective, rather than allowing a few bad apples to spoil the whole bunch, it is much more likely that people would believe in that academic discipline. The best way to restore trust is to weed out the bullshit. and that we should 
should not disagree with them, many would say that kind of off-kilter economic views should be published and people will not publish them when they seem less likely. It is the same as science. It is bad that junk science was published about tobacco, but we are able to weed that out. However, if we were able to find a study that suggested that secondhand smoke is not as dangerous to us as anyone might have thought before, that is an important study which changes the way we, impact, we deal with problems such as tobacco smoking. Things about issues which are controversial, but even ones that seem like 100% of people agree deserve to have off kilter views, not be chilled out by this policy. That's what we gave you from closing opposition. But importantly, we think creating this debate and having academic journals critique each other is a good, which is why we suggested that publishing things which are not 100% correct, perhaps because they have a methodological problem that is hard to point out, is a good thing. Because it is good for the follow-up article that shouts it down and says, well, this was the mistake that anyone could have made in the science that you two fell victim through. It was not a problem of a whole system of bullshit, but was just what is supposed to happen in academia. Secondly, we think that we set a POI that basically killed their corruption point, which is either you are going to offer huge bribes to journals in order to take their money, in order to shut them down, which is not a good thing to do because taking a bribe does not suggest that you're a bad journal. Instead, because you might have been publishing many great articles, it suggests that you are susceptible to bribes, which we should cut down on. That's why they dropped that part of their extension, and that's a contribution we made in a POI. Four, we think it's a terrible book to shut down journals. What's going to energise the alt-right more than literally shutting down a journal that says an alternative view? Yeah. They've never suggested how they're going to get the credibility back for academia, and government homogenised science is not the way to do it. Lastly, their idea that we could just publish in a trash journal is very silly. Firstly, because those trash journals can still be read by people and are only seen as trash by them, but not by most people, suggests that they don't get any of their benefits, given that you can still publish in your alt-right journal. But we have lost all the benefits of peer reviewing, which is through the peer review process, it's just not a process of going yes to you, but no to you. It is a process of refining articles to make them better and losing that opportunity in other journals is a terrible idea. So even in the fields that they love, like economics that I don't, we have won this debate. Next, this is incredibly unfair on small journals. Thomas gives you reasons why small journals are not able to be as good at statistics as they are, which is that, for example, they are less data-driven, they're less data-driven fields, but secondly, that it's hard to find large quantities of data in those, when you are poor, and thirdly, that these people just can't hire the best of the best, so they're not that good at methodology. Why not give them a chance to grow and be critiqued rather than just shutting them down because they're a shit journal? At closing opposition, we defend the right of shit journals to exist, to be run by a bunch of feminists who maybe aren't that good at statistics and to grow into one of the most important political forces that we have in academics. Lastly, even though they say there are some benefits to small journals, for example, that they can have weed the BS out from the non-BS, the code in Jimmy's speech was the non-BS is things everyone already agrees with, like black people are discriminated against, but radical theories which people find more difficult to accept are less likely to be accepted. From opening. If it is true that crazy bullshit is of, in fact enormous social value, then isn't the biggest benefit in this debate our model, which just creates a lot of crazy bullshit? <laughs>
Thomas says it, no one responds to it. Lastly, we think the government is the least appropriate actor to be doing this. For it, we told you that they cannot decide what is and isn't bullshit. And for the reason that they cannot decide what is and isn't bullshit was the same reason why one, two, three, four speakers could not decide what is and isn't bullshit. This is much bigger than the harm the opening, um, the opening opposition gives you, which is like that literal nonsense still has value. We have told you that <laughs>